Good evening, and uh, welcome to the Andrew Carnegie Free Library and Music Hall. Thank you so much for being here this evening. My name is Walker Evans. I'm the library director here. Uh, today, it's my honor to introduce Dr. David Rosenberg's exhibit, The Fruits of Hate, A French City During the Holocaust. These stories of the Jewish citizens of Amiens, France, are vivid, moving, and important. In January 2024, the city of Amiens will officially remember the 80th anniversary of the roundup and deportation to death camps of its Jewish citizens. Marking this occasion, Dr. Rosenberg's exhibit will be on display in the city's main public library. And on behalf of the Library and Music Hall, I am honored to host this work in its first exhibition in a US public library here. Uh, following tonight's talk, I invite you to help yourself to some refreshments. Uh, please remember to sign our guest book uh, in the back by the largest portrait of Abraham Lincoln in this room. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rosenberg, Grove City College Associate Professor of French and Department Chair Kelsey Madsen, and Dr. Madsen's students, Virginia Williams, Caitlin LaVorse, and Marcus Henry, who will share new English translations of French accounts of the 1944 Roundup. Please welcome Dr. David Rosenberg. Good evening, merci beaucoup, uh, <laughs> Dr. Walker, and to elect the Speaker of the House. <laughs> and and um, I'll be mentioning a couple of terms tonight uh, that may not process well for you. Uh, the word some, S-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. It's the department or the county district. France was divided into departments at the French Revolution named after natural features. Uh, and the Sum River runs through the city of Amiens, which is the focus of this exhibit, A-M-I-E-N-S. Don't pronounce the S. I'm doing some work, advanced work for the French teachers in the, in the, in the audience. Amiens, no S. And it's the capital of the department of the Sum, S-O-M-M-E. And so you'll hear me mention that word, Jews of the Sum. Uh, and Jews of the Sum is also the title of a website that my daughter Olivia and I have been working on for many years, www.jewsofthesum, S-O-M-M-E, -M -E, one, one term. You'll also hear me mention the term prefect. The prefect was the top-ranking civilian administrator, a, a Vichy official, un, uh, while the German military uh, supervised the whole situation, but with only uh, a, a scant number of people. Okay, that's that's all I wanted to say by way of preface. And now, uh, now my talk actually begins. So strap in. <laughs> on January fourth, nineteen forty-four, at six o'clock on a frigid morning, members of the Gestapo pounded on the door of the Schulhoff family at 14 Rue Albert de Calonne in Amiens. At the commotion and following a pre-thought out plan, three of the Schulhoff children, aged 21, 18, and 10, managed to escape through a window and reach safety in the countryside. Their father, mother, grandmother, and adopted half-brother, however, were all arrested and taken to the police station on the Rue des Jacobins. By evening, the arrested were on their way with several dozen more Jews from Amiens to Drancy, the camp for the Jews outside Paris. On January 20th, 1944, with over 1,000 more French Jews, they were deported as part of Convoy 66 to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where the overwhelming number of them were gassed on arrival. 
The tragic arrest of January 4th took place a bare seven months before Amiens was liberated by Allied forces on August 31st, 1944. I first became interested in the fate of the Jews of Amiens when I started visiting the city on a regular basis after my retirement from the Archives Department at the University of Pittsburgh. Former colleague Lloyd Cohen is here today. However, my acquaintance with this picturesque city with its magnificent 13th century Gothic cathedral had begun much earlier, in 1973, when I traveled there to do research on the Protestants of Amiens during the Reformation. The archives of the city of Amiens are really a treasure, and I spent many happy hours there en route to my PhD and after. When I started looking into the documentation on the wartime history of the Jews, however, I was disappointed. There seemed to be very little information in the Amiens Departmental Archives about the administration of the anti-Jewish policies which we know were put in place and enforced between 1940 and 1944. After a few years of research, I learned why. In November 1945, the post-war French government ordered the prefects of the French departments to send their files related to the wartime confiscation of Jewish properties to Paris so that claims for restitution could, in theory, be settled efficiently. In this way, 34,000 pages specifically on the Jews of Amiens and the region had flown the coop from Amiens to the National Archives in Paris. Moreover, it was not just property files, but information on the imposition of the Yellow Star program on the Jews of the area, and letters written by individual Jews pleading for exemptions from the harshly discriminatory regulations. This was my first big discovery. Then in 2017, again in Paris, but this time at the French Holocaust Museum, I discovered on a roll of microfilm a set of photo identification slips or fiches, as the French call them. It's really fiche, no S. <laughs> Sorry, I, I sinned. Okay, as the French call them, maintained by the prefect of the Somme. I saw that these fiches contained passport-sized photos of the Jews of the Somme in 1942, enabling me to see the faces of many individuals for whom no other images had so far come to light. These twin discoveries, the major document cache, which I discovered in 2014, and the photo identification slips, which I came upon in 2017, enabled me to put voices, i.e. the letters to the prefect, and faces via the photo ID cards together, and inspired me to develop the current exhibit, as well as the website www.jewsofthesum.com. The Jews of the Sun website, managed by my daughter Lydia Rosenberg, includes images of the panels, an extensive collection of scanned original documents, blog-style articles about individuals and families, and a growing body of original photographs from the private collections of relatives and descendants. The snowball effect produced by both the exhibit and the website has been evident. The original exhibit, designed by Lydia, debuted at Temple Emanuel of the South Hills in March 2018, under the title, Who is a Jew, Amiens, France, 1940 to 1945. It moved from there to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, to Hillman Library at Pitt, and to the Duquesne University Library, where Dr. Sarah Barron and her team created additional panels with photographs and talk tiles which you will see in the current display. The exhibit then went to the Bower Hill Community Church in Mount Lebanon, and now thanks to Library Director Walker Evans to this beautiful historical building. Meanwhile, in January 2019, the French language version of the exhibit, entitled Etre Juif dans la Somme, 1940 to 45, was presented at the Library of the University of Picardy in Amiens, the place where it happened. 
Visitors who signed the guest book were quick to draw connections. A terrifying realism, one visitor commented. It happened in my street, the Rue de la Cotoscar, and in my village, Cave Aubier. It was yesterday, but also a bit today. This period of history seems so remote, wrote the mayor of Amiens, Brigitte Foulet, and at the same time so present. How is it possible? Why such implacable wickedness? There are no words. The exhibit has subsequently been lent by the University of Picardy to three French high schools in Amiens and two middle schools in nearby cities. This coming January, in conjunction with the civic commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the 1944 Roundup in Amiens and the Somme, the French exhibit will be displayed for a month in the Bibliothèque Lumière-Lan, the main public library of Amiens. Since its inception, the Jews of the Sun site has attracted over 11,000 visits, more than 7,000 from the U.S. and more than 3,000 from France. A page of the website focuses specifically on the roundup of January 1944. It has been one of the most often visited, but chiefly in France. The page has an English introduction and commentary, but the second half of the page which contains witness accounts of the roundup, is almost exclusively in French. Dr. Kelsey Madsen's French language students at Grove City College have remedied this limitation by translating the witness documents into English, making them accessible to non-French speakers for the first time. This is an outstanding contribution both to the exhibit and to the website where it will soon be appearing. We are honored to be able to hear some of these new translations, and I'd like to thank Dr. Madsen and the students of Grove City College sincerely for their participation. Dr. Madsen. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Today, the Second World War remains a popular topic for films, novels, and documentaries. But for younger generations, the relation, relationship to it is increasingly abstract. Current college students are less likely to have grown up knowing relatives who remember experiences from the war. For many, that was their great-grandparents' generation. For myself, though I was born over 40 years after the war, I felt a connection to it through stories of my grandfather's time as a B-52 bomber pilot. My other grandfather lost a cousin in the war, and we visited his grave in Belgium. The living memory of my relatives made the war feel close in a way that, for instance, the First World War didn't. As a professor at Grove City College, a small Christian liberal arts college about an hour north of here, I teach classes in French language, literature, and culture. This past spring, I taught a class on the history and memory of the occupation, the resistance, and the collaboration in World War II era France. On the opening day of the course, I asked the students about their own associations or family connections to the war. And I was struck by how my students, about 17 years younger than me, described the war as fascinating and important, but a somewhat distant historical curiosity. In fact, this was a more pronounced sentiment than when I had taught the class four years prior. To be clear, I don't state this as a critique of the students, but to illustrate the, how the passage of time leads to an inevitable shift in our relationship with the events of the past. Last spring, that French class visited the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh and also saw David Rosenberg's exhibit, this exhibit, when it was at Bower Hill Community Church. Dr. Rosenberg also joined the class via Zoom for discussion, and he speaks excellent French. We, we hope especially in French. In subsequent correspondence, he proposed a translation project to commemorate the forthcoming 80th anniversary of the January 1944 roundup in Amiens. And I'm grateful that he's given us the opportunity to work alongside him in this effort to preserve the stories of Jewish men, women, and children who were unjustly arrested and deported during the occupation. He could have done the translation himself, or I could have, but having students translate the documents allowed them to apply their French skills as a form of public service and also to cultivate a personal, humanized connection with individuals and their stories. In fact, most of the translation participants were not in the class with me last spring. So this has been an opportunity for more students to engage with this troubling moment in history, where we can see the dangerous effects of intolerance, from gradually curtailed freedoms, the anxiety of living under uncertainty and surveillance, to active state violence.
For the students of the GCC French program, this translation project has allowed them to actively contribute to the transmission of history and memories between generations, between cultures, and between communities. Our contribution is, of course, only possible because of the research that David Rosenberg has carried out, which you see here tonight, and which is available in more detail at the Jews of the Sun website, already mentioned, um, and co-created with his daughter, Lydia Rosenberg. Our new translations pertaining to the January 1944 Roundup will be added to the website in due time, and Rosalie College will host this exhibit on campus in April of 2024. We're joined here today by three of the students who worked on the translations. Caitlin Lavorse, a French and political science double major sophomore, Marcus Henry, a biology and French double major freshman, and I'd like to note that we're able to present the full translation today because Marcus went above and beyond. He translated over half the documents. And Virginia Williams, a biology major junior who's also taking advanced French. A fourth student, Kara Scott, a philosophy and French double major senior, edited the final translations alongside me. She planned to attend tonight, but was unable to attend, um, so um, Marcus will be reading her passages. A fifth translator, Jacqueline Nichols, graduated in May with a degree in political science. In the past week, I've collected reflections from the students about their experience with translating, editing, and rereading the documents. Several students noted that it was easy to get lost in word choice and tone while translating but that then there was often a moment of breakthrough. For instance, Kara wrote, there's a certain degree of removal that comes with reading historical texts, especially when they're written in a language other than your mother tongue. As I began the translation and editing process, I would initially feel distance from the accounts. However, whenever I got to the end of each account where the writer would describe the moment of arrest, the significance of what I had just worked on would hit me. The depictions of the arrests of children were especially disturbing. Caitlin noted similar sentiments, adding, in rereading the translation and making the final touches, I realized that what I had translated really happened, and that someone sat down and wrote the letter I was translating. I was helping tell someone's story in English for the first time, and that was incredibly impactful. Marcus commented, it's always interesting to see history from a first-hand account, a unique point of view. This way of looking at things is an interesting reconnection with the often emotionless facts we learn about history, to the people whose lives it impacted, especially on a smaller scale than the grand generals and politicians who make a larger mark on history. Virginia translated an exchange, not in tonight's readings, between Jacques Louvia and a local bureaucrat. She observed, his mother was harassed by the Gestapo, French, and German authorities because of her Jewish status, and later she suffered from poverty and died of illness. While translating, I hoped that at the very least her son could receive a certificate which validated that she was horribly mistreated, because that would at least give her some justice. Yet, in the next letter I translated, the prefect revealed that no documentation existed. This was disheartening to me because of the unfairness, of the lack of justice, apology, and remembrance for this woman and the pain she had to endure. As you listen to the readings of a selection of the translations, you'll notice the use of the term Israelite. Dr. Rosenberg has noted that in French, Israelite, Israelite, and Juif, Jew, were used interchangeably, but Israelite comes across as more respectful uh, in context, and Juif was the term that was inscribed in the yellow stars. Note also that the readings range from survivor testimonies to family memories to letters sent to or by French bureaucrats. Most of the people discussed in these letters or testimonies never returned. And for some, only the barest outline of their stories can be known. For me, this brings to mind the book Dora Bruder by French Nobel Prize winning author Patrick Modiano. It is about his search in the archives for traces of a Jewish teenager from Paris who died at Auschwitz. He writes, I shall never know how she spent her days. That is her secret. A poor and precious secret that not even the executioners, the decrees, the occupying authorities, the depot, the barracks, the camps, history, time, everything that defiles and destroys you have been able to take away from her. As we listen to the students read, let us honor the lives recounted, including what remains unknowable. Dr. Rosenberg, the students and I are honored to present you with these translations in memory of the 80th anniversary
Survived Auschwitz, although her, fa her father, Leon, president of the Jewish Community Association, did not. The interview was published in a local French newspaper five months after the liberation. On January 4th, 1944, members of the Gestapo arrived at Monsieur Loret's home on the Rue de la The Gestapo took Madame Ponchou and her father away from their home under the pretext that further information was needed from the police headquarters. Both were immediately taken to a building on the Rue de Jacobin, where many Israelite residents of the summit had been taken. That same evening, everyone there who had been arrested was transferred to the camp at Drancy. The arrest of Raymond Schulhoff, age 45, Lucie Clarat Schulhoff, age 42, Louise Levy, age 70, and Georges Hirsch, age 9, at 14 Rue Amérique de Calum, at 6 in the morning on January 4, 1944. From Jeanette Hertz, or Schulhoff's autobiographical memoir, History of a Jewish, Jewish Family in France Under the Occupation, published in 1982. The afternoon and the evening of January 3rd are engraved in my memory, down to the smallest details. In one of the two ground floor rooms where we slept, my grandmother and I ironed laundry on the special plank that I used as a desk. Among the shirts and the towels, I had placed a page of handwritten notes. There was also a large Greek dictionary, which was salvaged a few days later by someone who passed by. Seeing the open door, he entered to take something, anything, out of defiance for the Germans and out of sympathy for us. That afternoon, Lucy, Zaza, and I left to go window shopping. We wanted to choose dresses. It had been a long time since we had walked side by side, all three of us. Mama said, it seems strange having such her own daughters. She was 42 years old. The evening was like all the others, with the adults listening to Radio London in the cellar so that the scrambled radio signals weren't, audi weren't audible from the street. We talked about the broadcast where the children played. The battle was raging in Italy, where there was an aggressive advance from the Allies. On every front, the German army was retreating. The end was near. During the night, after everyone had gone to sleep, I tried to read a little in the silence next to the nearly extinguished stove. Then, I slipped into my bed, distractedly forgetting to say goodnight to my grandmother. The next day, at six o'clock, the front door close to my room was shaken by violent, repeated knocks. At daybreak on January 4th, 1944, the Gestapo proceeded with the arrest of all the Jews who were still alive, whether they were French or not, in Amiens and in the region. Several dozen in all. The arrest of the Weinberg family at Rosier en Santerre, Mont January 4th, 1944, from the sub prefect of Mont to the prefect of the Sun. I write to inform you that today the German authorities arrested Dr. Benjamin Weinberg, living in Rosier, his wife, Jessia, née Eisenberg, and their child, Jean Louis. The reasons for this action are not known. The Weinberg family was taken to the city of Amien. Dr. Weinberg, an Israelite of Russian origin, became a naturalized French citizen on December 29, 1938. His attitude with regard to French laws was most proper. Mobilized as a doctor on September 1, 1939, he was commended by order of his regiment on July 10, 1940. Signed, the subprefect. The arrest of Cécile Ridlick, age 14, along the Rue d'Albert, Amiens, around noon on January 4, 1944. 
from Claude Watteau's book, From Amiens to Auschwitz, The Tragedy of the Red Lip, self-published in 2013. Cecile spent almost 18 months at the Waterloo home. Opportunity to meet some people who knew her at this time, neighbors or old classmates. There are unfortunately not many memories of her. However, and this is by chance, we know with considerable precision uh, the conditions under which Cecile was taken on January 4, 1944. A Tuesday, around noon, after she got back from school. A black truck stopped at 79 Rue d'Albert. The German policeman entered the Waterloo's house. Cecile hid herself in a room off the hallway. She understood right away what was happening. While the policemen were speaking to the Waterloo's in the kitchen, she succeeded in leaving the house and took refuge at number 63, the Delmont Grocery, belonging to her friend Eliane, who told me this story. Sadly, a German, wearing civilian clothes, a member of the Gestapo, remained on the sidewalk and spotted her. All he had to do was pick her up. She was wearing a blue dress. <laughs> The arrest and deportation of Bert and Fernand Nazar on January 4, 1944, as recounted by their great-granddaughter, historian Louise de Sèvres Audelon. Audelon. In the autumn of 1943, Fernand and Bert spent their days as peacefully as they could under the circumstances. They thought continually of their son Jean, who was deported to the Arhenier concentration camp in 1941. Fernand sketched constantly, Bert mended tirelessly, keeping up her housework with care despite the restriction of this period of occupation. The German policemen arrested them at their home on the morning of January 4th, 1944. A few days prior, anticipating their arrest, Fernand and Bert had entrusted their daughter with a small box containing their most precious goods, hoping to protect them from the Germans. From the Germans. The Gestapo would nevertheless seize these on the fifth, just as they would take possession of the house in the Rue Saint-Rémy. Transferred from Amiens to Drancy the night of January 4th, Fernand and Bert Lazar were deported to Auschwitz in Convoy 66 on January 20th. The few survivors can attest to the many acts of violence at each stage of the three-day journey. One of them, upon his return to Lutetia in 1945, told Simone Audin about the particularly tragic death, particularly tragic circumstances of her father's death. Shocked by the brutality of an SS man who was assaulting one of his unfortunate companions in the freight car, Fernand Lazar cried out, attempting to intervene, Oh, you brute. He was instantly killed, in cold blood, by a bullet to the head. So it was then alone, along the lifeless body of her husband, that Bert Lazar completed the journey that would bring her, during the night between January 22nd and 23rd, 1944, to the crematorium of Birkenau. Birkenau was 75 years old, Bert 64. Rosa Duchek, age 40, detained in the January 4th roundup, saved at the Amiens train station. From Jeanette Hertz Schulhoff's autobiographical memoir, History of the Jewish Family in France Under the Occupation, published in 1982. The detainees of the roundup, several dozen, would remain cooped up in the court of the police station the entire day. I had to battle against the terrible desire to go over to see them, to speak to them. I felt that they were suffering from the full. I told myself that Mama's only good pair of shoes were at the cobbler's. The fact that I was not able to attempt anything to help them torments me still, many years later. At the end of the day, the convoy took the train for Paris and the Drancy transit camp. But the wife of Leo, a Turkish Jew already arrested the year prior, was saved by an anonymous person who threw himself on her behind a beam of the damaged train station. He pushed her into a parked train car, parked freight car, excuse me, along the platform and she rolled to the other side without anyone noticing anything. I knew these details, and my father even alluded to them in his letter written from Drancy. Leo's wife never came back to me in, and I can't say what happened to her, but I haven't forgotten this life-saving deed. The arrest of Fernand Rakowitz, age 56, and her daughter, Jeanette Rakowitz, age 20, at Bouc Maison on January 7, 1944. 
as recounted in 2001 by Raymond Records, son of Hernan and brother of Jeanette, who survived the runner along with his father. On the morning of January 7th, very early, my mom was busy making coffee. All of a sudden, a car stopped, and I heard a voice with a German accent say to Mama, you are Madame Rakowitz, the Jew. We have come to arrest you. Prepare a small suitcase with some personal effects. My mother, unfazed, continued to make her coffee, and the agent at the shop opened him and wait. Madame, prepare your bag. We are pressed for time. Close by, still in bed because of a fever, I decided to escape from the raid. Stealthily, I put on slippers and a robe. I opened and left out the window and headed towards our neighbor's garden. Bypassing Armand Ricky and jumping over a thorny hedge, I went to ring Madame Bayel's doorbell. She was astonished to see me at her door and asked Raymond, what is going on? The German police are coming to arrest us. Quickly, quickly, my boy, come in and get into bed. I was safe for the moment. My father, prevented from practicing his trade, had given himself over to field work in nearby farms. He had, head he had headed there very early that morning as usual. My sister Jeanette had left to make purchases with the butchers. Many neighbors had gathered around the house, astonished and intrigued to see the Gestapo there. Jeanette anxiously joined this group upon her return. When Mama left, accompanied by the police officers, the neighbors rushed to kiss her and offer moral support. And Jeanette approached and could not stop herself from crying, Mama, Mama. Ma, your daughter, shouted one of the police officers. In that case, we'll go back to your home and you'll prepare another bag. Official actions. On January 5th, the day after the roundup, a prefect of the Somme Charles de Peru pleads the case of several of those who were arrested in order to Fernand de Brunon, the French ambassador to the Germans in Paris. Amiens, January 5th, 1944. To follow it up on my phone call earlier today, I write to inform you that the German authorities proceeded yesterday, January 4th, with the arrest of all the Israelites of French nationality residing in my department. Moreover, I include here the provisional list. Among the arrested people are three Jewish children aged 9, 9, and 14, Hirsch George, born June 14, 1934, in Vienna, residing at 14 Rue Abrique de Cologne and Amiens. Redwich Cecil, born April 29, 1929, in Paris, residing at 9 Rue Cotrelle Maison in Amiens. The young Lambert Jean Louis, Born April 24, 1935, in Amiens, residing in Rosier en Santerre. Others seem to have been arrested by error. Monsieur Chouaf Raymond, born March 25, 1898, in Paris, residing at 14 rue Abrique de Cologne, in Amiens, along with his wife, Ne Levi Florette, born April 2, 1901, in Verdun and his mother-in-law, Madame Lavie Louise, born February 26, 1873, in Thionville. Monsieur Schkoloff was in possession of the identity card, carte de légitimation, number 800, valid until February 29, 1944. You will find the photograph of the card attached. As this document specifies, Monsieur Schkoloff who served as a delegate of the General Union of the Israelites of France, must be spared any detention orders. The same protection extends to his family residing with him. Finally, two people of Aryan race were also subject to a detention order. Monsieur Kazmin Vladimir Aryan, born December 24, 1900, in Veronege of French nationality, veteran of the 1939 through 1940 war, decorated with the Croix de Guerre, residing for more than 25 years in Amiens at 131 Rue del Peche. The above named individual was arrested at the same time as his wife of Jewish race, Monsieur Lehmann André Ariane, shirtmaker, 
for November 1st, 1893, and Besson Song. From a judgment reached by the President of the Civil Tribunal of Amiens on June 4th, 1943, a copy of which you will find attached, the aforementioned layman cannot be considered a Jew as defined by the law of June 2nd, 1941. Consequently, I would be very obliged to you if you would be willing to intervene, should you judge it appropriate, with the upper-ranking German authorities in order to obtain the release of these eight people. I will add that approaching the local services of the German security police did not produce any effect, and that all of these people were conducted to the Drency internment camp on January 4th at 8.20 p.m. The Prefect. Jewish but Catholic. The following letter relates to the continued investigation into Rachel Kuwalt's situation in February 1944. The bureaucrats in Amiens did not realize that Rachel Kuwalt had already been deported to Auschwitz on February 3rd and that their efforts were to no purpose. Amiens, February 16th, 1944. From the police commissioner to Monsieur, the prefect of the Department of the Somme at Amiens. This reply is in reference to your letter dated February 14, 1944, relating to an inquiry on the subject of Madame Hubault residing in Amiens at 39 Thiers Boulevard. The aforementioned woman was arrested on January 4, 1944, by the German authorities on account of her Jewish origin. She currently finds herself interned at the Drancy camp. She is Jewish but Catholic. A baptismal certificate was delivered from the Church of Saint Anne in Amiens dated September 14, 1921. Madame Hubault is very well regarded in Amiens. Having good behavior and moral conduct, she has not come under any prior judicial or political scrutiny. Her two children are in possession of a certificate delivered from the Commissaire General for Jewish Affairs on January 14, 1944, under the terms of which they cannot be considered Jews according to the June 2, 1941 law. I think that, given her situation, an intervention with German field commander can be attempted in her favor. I salute you, you I, I embrace you, and I, I, I thank you for, for helping me and Lydia and other people who have contributed along the way uh, bring these people forward. Uh, they deserve attention. They deserve their names to be known. They deserve their stories to be known, and you have helped them do that. And if you ex ex excuse the expression, God bless you.
Okay, good.